So the Dow Jones is at 26,000, and everybody is convinced it's got no place to go but up. I don't think investors have not been this optimistic, right? They do a survey of sentiment. They have not been this optimistic since 1987. I found that hard to believe that even, they're even more optimistic than they were at the height of the technology bubble, the dot-com bubble, the new era. Of course, 1987 didn't end well, right? We had a stock market crash. And there's a lot about what's happening today that reminds me about what was happening in 87. But before I get to that, I want to get to this, the whole premise, right? Everything is based on the enthusiasm over Donald Trump and the Republicans and these tax cuts, or that I, I keep hearing, and the, 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 the talking heads that are, that are on television, now I, I only watch them. See, they used to let me come on television and debate them. Now I just have to watch them. But when I debated them in 2005 and 2006 and 2007, and they were just as enthusiastic about Bush back then as they are about Trump now, and they were saying all the same stuff about how great everything was, it was a perfect economy and nothing could go wrong, and, and I kept saying, look, this is a bubble, and what you guys are doing is very dangerous because the Republicans are going to get blamed when this thing comes crashing down. And that's exactly what happened, and that's why Obama became president. They're making the same mistake again, right? The economy has not improved under Trump, right? We don't have a booming economy. I mean, Trump keeps telling us we have a booming economy, but nothing is booming. Look, we are going to get the GDP numbers, I think, at the end of next week for the first year. We're going to, we're going to get the fourth quarter, and then we'll know the entire year. And it's going to be better than the average of the last four years, but not by much. It's not even going to be 3%. It's going to be maybe 2.7, 2.8. I'm not exactly sure. And that is a little bit better than the average for Obama's second term. But Obama had one year of 2.9 in his second term. We're going to be below that. So it doesn't look like anything has changed so far. So everything is on the come. Everybody is betting that, well, it's going to get better. Now, yes, the unemployment rate keeps going down. But it was going down before Trump became president. In fact, when Donald Trump was a candidate for president, he said that the unemployment numbers were phony. They were fake. They were a fraud. They were a con. He said the real unemployment rate is 30 percent, 40 percent. You know, now every time there's an unemployment number that comes out, he's tweeting about how great it is that we have this record low unemployment and we should all give him credit for it. So it, but it's the exact same fraud that, 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 that he rightly called out because, again, the trends that have continued is the uh, collapse in labor force participation and the proliferation of part-time jobs. In fact, real wage growth is actually lower. Right? The first year of the Trump administration, I think it's lower than the average under the second term of Obama. So wages aren't growing. Right? It's the same old uh, lousy job. So the economy is not booming. Now, did we get all the massive deregulation? No. Obamacare is still here. We didn't get rid of Obamacare. I mean, that was a big thing. We're supposed to get rid of it. It's still here. Now, we got rid of the penalties for not buying insurance, but all that's going to do is mean that even fewer people will buy it, which is going to create an even bigger upward pressure for insurance. So insurance prices will go up even faster as a result of the fact that they took Obamacare and made it worse. Right? They didn't get rid of it. They just, made, they just took something that didn't work, and now it doesn't work even worse. That's all they did. There hasn't been massive uh, deregulation. Now, what about the tax cuts? Are they going to grow the economy? No, because they didn't cut government spending. But see, you don't get government for nothing. Right? Taxes pay for government. But if you cut taxes, but you don't cut government, how do you pay for that government? See, that's all we did with the Republican tax cuts. We decided to borrow the money instead of raise it by taxes. And how is that going to grow the economy? Because if that was true, well, then just cut taxes even more. Now, just eliminate them altogether. Why have any taxes? Just borrow it all. And of course, a lot of the money isn't really borrowed because the Federal Reserve just creates money out of thin air and buys the bonds. So it's all inflation. So we end up substituting tax revenue for debt and inflation. And I believe that the debt and inflation that we have to create to finance the tax cuts will be a bigger drag on the economy than the tax cuts are a boost. So there is going to be no growth uh, from these tax cuts in the economy, but where there will be growth is in the budget deficits. And that kind of is where I see some of the similarity now in the 1980s, 1987, 
because these big budget deficits are going to be a big problem because the deficits are already huge and they're about to get much bigger. Right? I mean, Trump likes to have huge things, but it's not true when it comes to a deficit that has to be financed. And, and I think the deficits, according to the, the government uh, you know, statisticians, the, the plan was supposed to add one and a half trillion to the deficit over 10 years, which is what, 150 billion a year. I think they're way underestimating the real impact of these tax cuts. And I think they're doing that for two reasons. One, I think a lot of Americans are going to rearrange their affairs and recharacterize their income in such a way to qualify for some of these new loopholes that were created. And I don't think any of that is baked into their assumptions. They're just assuming that people who are making a certain amount of money are going to pay a 37% rate. But in reality, if they become an independent contractor or they you know, do something to get his, you know, pass, they're not going to pay 37. They're going to, they're going to pay you know, 28 or some much lower number, 20% lower number. So I think that the tax cuts are actually bigger than what people believe. Also, I believe that a lot of the states, and I was warning about this before they passed it, but I think a lot of the states are going to rearrange their tax systems uh, to put more of the taxes on employers rather than employees to maybe m move income taxes into payroll taxes, which would still be fully deductible. Some states are now l allowing people to make charitable contributions instead of paying state taxes, and they can get a credit for their charitable in, uh, contribution, which is still deductible. So I think that there's going to be other gimmicks that will come up, and that means that they're not going to raise as much revenue. So I, I, I would say that the impact on the budget deficit is going to be much greater uh, than uh, what they are forecasting. But also, rather than having continuous economic growth, I think the economy is going into recession. Now, I, I believe that had... Donald Trump lost that election, the U.S. would already be in recession. I think we were clearly headed to recession before he won. And when he won, he created this huge burst of misplaced optimism that probably postponed the onset of that recession by another year or two because people ran out and spent a little more and businesses invested a little more because they were anticipating all these growth policies that are actually not going to materialize. In fact, a lot of the extra consumer spending was a function of debt. You know, the savings rate has fallen to a 10-year low in the United States. So the fact that we spent a little more money, they, people tapped into a pretty shallow uh, savings pool. And what did they buy? They bought imports, which is what everybody buys in America. The trade deficit, the most recent trade deficit, hit the highest level, I think, in six years. But this is interesting, too, or more important. If you take out oil and just look at the deficit X oil, it was the biggest deficit ever. And what's happened to the price of oil now? It's going up, right? And America, even though we produce oil, we are still net importers of oil. So the trade deficit is headed much higher, and so is the budget deficit. You have these twin deficits, and the last time they were a big problem was 1987. Because what happens when you have uh, these big deficits, a trade deficit, and a budget deficit, it puts downward pressure on the dollar. Now, I was here a year ago, and I gave my talk, and at that time, everybody was bullish on the dollar. I mean, not everybody here, but everybody, let's say, in the mainstream, all the big Wall Street firms. I mean, the single most crowded trade out there at the end of 2016, the beginning of 2017, was long the dollar. I mean, it could only go up, right? Because Trump was going to cut taxes, the economy was going to grow faster, so the Fed was going to have to raise rates more, and all that was going to help the dollar. And so everybody loaded up on the dollar. What happened in 2017? The dollar had its first down year in five years. But it was the biggest drop in 14 years. So it was a pretty bad year. And this year, it's off to a much worse start than last year. Because last year, the dollar was up for the first two or three weeks of, the, uh, of January. It was, the enthusiasm was still there. Everybody was short the yuan. All these hedge funds were out there. It was the next big short. And everybody was convinced, oh, the yuan's going to get killed. I remember saying, these guys are going to get killed on this trade. It's going to go the other way. The Chinese yuan had its biggest rise in nine years last year. And in fact, I believe that this year, the dollar is going to hit an all-time record low. I think we're going to crack below 6 to 1 
in yuan. That's never happened. We're 6.4 right now. The record low is about 6.1. But I think we're going to crack through 6, and I think that's very significant. I don't think the dollar will hit a record low against the euro or the yen this year, but it could easily do it, I think, next year in, in 2019. The dollar was falling in the late 1980s. From 85 to 87, the dollar got killed. Now, what happens when the dollar is going down? Interest rates are going to go up. And what is happening? The yield now on the U.S. 10-year is still low. It's about 2.63 or 4 or something like that. But it's the highest in almost four years. And why is this significant? See, because if the dollar is going down, right, why would anybody outside the United States want to buy a 10-year Treasury yield yielding, you know, 2.6 percent? I mean, you can only do it if you hedge the currency. But if you actually look now at the cost of hedging U.S. Treasuries, it creates a negative yield. So you can't make money. The cost of putting on a hedge right now in dollars wipes out the entire yield of U.S. Treasuries. So there is no real investment demand outside the United States for Treasuries because nobody could buy a Treasury and make any money, right? Not unless they want to gamble on the dollar turning around. But why would you want to take that gamble? Especially if you look at stocks all around the world, stock markets everywhere are going up. Who is going to settle for a lousy 2.6% return and take all that currency risk? And of course, there's also interest rate risk, because if interest rates go up, bonds go down. Now, Americans aren't going to buy treasuries, one, because they're broke, they don't have any money to buy treasuries, but again, they all want to buy stocks. Who's going to want to buy a low-yielding treasury? And of course, the Federal Reserve has already basically said they're out of the treasury buying game. Right now, I don't believe them. I've never believed them. But they've been talking about the fact that they are uh, going to unwind their balance sheet. Right now, it's about four and a half trillion dollars, and it's you know it's, it hasn't shrunk at all since they've been talking about it. But everybody believes that they're going to shrink the balance sheet. Well, in order to shrink the balance sheet, that means they're a net seller of treasuries. That means the treasuries that they hold, they're going to let them mature. They're not going to roll them over. So that means the Treasury has to find an alternative, a replacement buyer for those Treasuries. Well, who's going to do it? Now, China, there were already rumors like a week ago that China is finished buying dollars, that they don't want to buy them anymore either, or Treasuries, which means they're going to do the same thing as the Fed. But of course, if the Central Bank of the United States doesn't want to buy any more Treasuries, why should the Central Bank of China want to buy them? Right? It makes sense. Now, they came out with a rumor denying that, but I read the denial, and you know what? They really didn't deny it. So to me, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Plus, why the hell would the Chinese want to buy any more treasuries? So if the Chinese aren't buying treasuries, you no, know, the Japanese and the Chinese are the two biggest foreign creditors. Japanese don't look like they're buying them anymore either. So I don't think there's any real buyers. I just think they're sellers. I think that we're going to break the downtrend. This big bull market, this 30 whatever year bull market, the bond bull market started, believe it or not, um, in, in, probably in, 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 the, in the early 80s. And you know, we've had, you know, we've had uh, you know, cyclical you know, declines, but yields in general have been coming down for all that time. That's about to change. Yields are now going higher, much higher. But here's the problem. America's broke. America has more debt than ever before. The national debt is getting closer now to 21 trillion. Uh, in 19, 2008, it was what? Not even 10 trillion when we started the financial crisis. So the debt has more than doubled since the financial crisis. Why do we have a financial crisis? Because we had too much debt. Well, now we have much more, right? And it's not just the, the, the federal debt that's gone up. American individuals, are in debt more than they were back then. They have more credit card debt, they have more student loans, and they have more uh, car loans. We don't have more mortgage debt, but that's because home ownership is at a 50, 60 year low. So you, you can't have a mortgage if you don't have a house. But people don't have the home equity that they had. I mean, people are broke, people are living a paycheck to paycheck in, in the United States. So we can't withstand rising interest rates. What has really been propping up the US economy is cheap money and cheap gas. Right, because oil prices collapsed, uh, you know, a few years ago, and that gave everybody a boost. And we've had all this cheap money that has been able to prop up the government, the economy. But that goes away. That's it. I mean, interest rates could move up very quickly, right, and by a, by a large amount. But because we have so much debt, that is an enormous amount of money. I mean, think about what it does to the federal budget alone. So, if interest rates move up, that the deficit skyrockets. 
right? But here is the self-perpetuating spiral that we're in. As the deficits go up, right, now we have to sell more bonds. Well, that puts more downward pressure on bond prices and more upward pressure on interest rates. So as rising interest rates create bigger deficits, those bigger deficits create rising interest rates. It just keeps going on itself. The same thing with the dollar. The more bonds the, the Treasury wants to sell, the more dollars the Federal Reserve would have to create if it wanted to buy them to prevent that rate increase. See, right now it's not even talking about doing that. Right now it's saying it's going to sell bonds. But it's going to have to reverse. Because if it does nothing, interest rates keep going up. And what's that going to do? That's going to crash the stock market. That's going to crash the real estate market. That's going to cause another financial crisis if interest rates go up. When, it, when they rate, rose interest rates last time, so if you go back to the, the 08 crisis, and remember, we're still in, this is the same deal. It's the same game that's still going on. Because if you go back to my, my initial premise, if anybody read my first book, uh, Crash Proof, in that book, I basically laid out the problem as I saw it. And I said that the problem Maybe I can put it here. Oh, yeah, I can hide it behind this thing. I said that the problem was, you know, we had interest rates that were too low, right? After the dot-com bubble burst, the Fed lowered interest rates too much, and they had created a housing bubble, and that they were too slow to normalize interest rates. And I wrote that when eventually, you know, rates would move up, real estate prices would start to fall, and there would be a collapse, and that it would create a financial crisis, that we would have the worst recession since the Great Depression, we'd have double-digit unemployment, trillion-dollar deficits, you know, Fannie and Freddie would go bankrupt. All the things that happened were the things that I had forecast. But then I said that in response to that, the Federal Reserve would slash interest rates back down, they would print all kinds of money, and they would try to reflate the bubbles in the stock market and the real estate market to try to recreate what had just collapsed. And that because of that, there would be a dollar crash. That all that extra money that they created to, to try to reflate those bubbles would crash the dollar. Now, that's the only part that hasn't happened yet. Because what actually happened is after all those problems happened, and after the Fed did exactly what I said they were going to do, instead of the dollar going down, it went up. Now, sometimes that happens. Sometimes the markets can go in the opposite direction of where they're ultimately going to go. They create a head fake. They create a sucker rally. And because of the dollar's rally, something happened that I didn't expect. See, I thought they would try to reflate the bubbles. I didn't know they would succeed. But that's exactly what they did. They actually made the bubbles that popped even bigger. Right? But now, the dollar decline that I thought would happen sooner is happening now, except it's just getting started. And because we had this head fake rally in the dollar first, right, the US economy was allowed to get in much worse shape. See, had the dollar crashed in 2009, 2010, OK, you know, we could have dealt with our problems when they were smaller. I mean, they were still huge, but now they're much bigger, right, because we were able to go that much deeper into debt. We were able to do all these really bad things. So this dollar decline is just getting started. Nobody's really worried about it yet, right? But the dollar going down is the reason that bond prices are rising. It's the reason that oil prices are rising. The reason oil prices collapsed was because the dollar soared. The dollar went up because everybody was anticipating a successful end to quantitative easing, you know, a normalization of, of, of interest rates. But none of that was going to happen. But the markets were just betting on it anyway. But now the dollar is starting to go down. And now what's happening now? Inflation is picking up in consumer. Now, I remember a lot of people you know, were making fun of me because I said, oh, all this, you know, Peter said all this quantitative easing would cause inflation, and it hasn't happened. So he was wrong. Well, I didn't say quantitative easing would cause inflation. I said quantitative easing was inflation. And that the consequence of inflation would be rising prices. Now, consumer prices haven't risen as much as I think they're going to. Because what happened was a lot of that inflation, instead of showing up at the supermarket, right, showed up in the stock market, right, or in the real estate market, or in the bond market. See, inflation is what drove prices up, not nothing else. You know, the multiples have gone up. You know, um, I think uh, in the last four years, or you know, the last time that the S and P 500 uh, or that bond yields about four years ago 
the S&P is up about 45% and earnings are up maybe 6% during that time. You know, all of it is all based on hype. It's based on an expansion of multiples. It's because people, people are optimistic. So we haven't had um, actual, actual economic growth. People are just assuming, right? Just, it's like uh, the field of dreams. They, if they, if they, they just assume that they can build this recovery in their minds and it's going to be here uh, in reality. But anyway, so as, as interest rates start to, to rise, now all of a sudden, the, the burden, right? Because as long as we could have kept interest rates low, you know, the, the, the interest on the national debt is like uh, $250 billion, which is tiny when you look at almost a, 21, a $21 trillion debt. But the whole, this whole fake recovery, right, is based on this premise. So now we're at the point where inflation is coming back and people are dismissing it, right? We had inflation, the most recent numbers uh, were about a six year high in, in, in producer prices. Consumer prices year over year now are up about 2.1 two or 2.2. Two, two. I think the core is still just below 2%, but the trend you know, is about to break out. And if you look at what's happening in other commodity prices because of the dollar going down, we're gonna start to see this. Now initially, people are, are thinking, okay, this inflation is okay, and they think the rise in interest rates is okay, because they think it's a reflection of growth. They think it's the growing economy that is causing prices to rise or interest rates to rise, but it's not. It's inflation, or it's the weakness in the dollar that is pushing up prices. That's what's causing interest rates to rise. And at some point, right, the rising interest rates and the rising consumer prices are going to represent a big headwind for the US consumer, right? Because he's already broke, I said he's got no savings. Republicans are counting, or stock investors are counting on the tax cuts. I think the tax cuts will be overwhelmed by the increase in the cost of living, right? They're gonna have to, people are gonna have to pay more for their rent, they're gonna have to pay more for their utilities, they're gonna have to pay more for their food, they're gonna have to pay more for their health care. you know, uh, more for insurance. You know, insurance rates are really gonna go up because of last year's record losses uh, for hurricanes, uh, for fires. And you know, a lot of Americans still have adjustable rate mortgages. People forget about that. You know, a lot of people have gone, gotten complacent with their adjustable rate mortgages. Well, well, those things are about to go up. That's gonna take a lot of income out of the people who still have them. And there are a lot of people who have home equity lines of credit. And these have variable rates of interest. And you know what changed in the new tax laws? You can no longer deduct that interest from your taxes. So now you've got an increase in cost to finance your mortgage, which is no longer tax deductible. So a lot of this stuff is going to happen. And I think it's going to catch the stock market by surprise, right? Just like it did in 1987. In 1987, you had rising trade deficits, rising budget deficits, a sinking dollar, rising commodity prices. And for a while, the market just shrugged it all off until one day it mattered, right? And then the market, the market imploded. The difference between now and then is that we were in much better economic shape back then than we are back now. In fact, we were still really in a long-term bull market, and that was a correction, right? This has got to be the end of this, uh, this bull market. I think we're starting a brand new bear market. In fact, I think, again, if you want to measure prices in gold, we've been in a bear market, I think, since 2000. That was the peak. That was where the stock market peaked in value in terms of gold. And we've had a bear market rally these last several years where the gold price of the Dow has gone down, but it's nowhere near uh, where it was in 2000. I mean, the market hasn't even come close to making a new high priced in gold. And I think we're rolling over, and I think we're gonna make a new low, right? I still believe that the Dow Jones is gonna get near one ounce of gold. Now, at this point, you think, gee, the Dow's at 26,000 and gold's at 1,300. I mean, they're pretty far apart, right, for them to be equal. But they were equal in uh, 1980 at the bottom of that bear market. They were equal in 1932 at the, after the, the, the crash of 29. So we have a you know, couple of periods of time where that has been the case. And I would argue that the United States has economically never been in worse shape than it is now. And so if the, the Dow can go down to one ounce of gold at periods of time when we were in better shape economically than we are now, then it can certainly do it again. And I also believe, and this is the scenario that I think is gonna happen, that's gonna help drive that. See, Donald Trump 
you know, when he was a candidate, I already mentioned that, you know, he, he talked about how uh, the, the statistics were phony. But one of the things that he said that I liked when he was a candidate was that we were in a stock market bubble. It was a big, fat, ugly bubble, and that it's going to pop and it's going to be a disaster. And he, and he said that right up until he won the election. Now it's no longer a bubble. It's a bull market, and it's the Trump bull market. And he claims credit for that market going up every day. Right? So Trump and the Republicans own the stock market, and they own the economy. Had they not passed the tax cuts, they wouldn't have. But they got the tax cut passed, and they promised all kinds of great things. Of course, they're not going to happen. But they own the economy, and they own the market. So they're going to do everything they can to prop it up. Now, one of the things that Trump did when he was a candidate is he criticized um, Janet Yellen for doing political stuff with the Fed to try to artificially prop things up with cheap money. Well, he appointed somebody to do the exact same thing for him. And so what I think is going to happen is as interest rates really start to move up, as inflation starts to pick up, and as that starts to slow the economy and hurt the stock market, I expect the Federal Reserve to reverse course. I, I expect the Fed to start cutting rates again. I expect the Fed to do QE4. Now, if they don't do that, it's going to be a financial crisis. Right? If they do do that, it's going to be a dollar crisis, except it'll happen a little bit later. But they might not know that. The, the Fed just might think, we'll just do it all again. Right? It's worked so many times in the past, third time's a charm. Let's, let's do it. Right? I think it's going to be three strikes, you're out. I don't think they can do this again. So I think what's going to happen is once the Fed has to back away, because remember, the dollar just had its worst year in 14 years when everybody expects the Fed to raise rates, when everybody expects the Fed to shrink its balance sheet, when everybody expects the U.S. economy to boom. The dollar is tanking anyway, even in that environment. You couldn't ask for more positives, yet the dollar is falling. So imagine what happens to the dollar when the Fed has to say, no, we're going to cut rates. Oh, we're going to print more dollars. We're going to do QE4. Right? And of course, as inflation picks up, see right now, it, the, the crazy thing is people still have a mentality that high inflation is good for the dollar. Crazy, right? Because, and, but that's, that, that happens. Anytime there's a country and they report higher inflation numbers, their currency rises if they're higher than expected. That's the opposite of what should happen, right? Because inflation means the currency is losing value by definition. So why would you want to buy more of a currency when it's losing value faster than you thought? Well, what people think is that, well, if inflation is higher in the U.S., well, the Fed is going to be more tight. It's going to raise interest rates. And it's the idea that rates are going to rise faster that is what's propping up the dollar. But the reality is inflation is going to get worse and the Fed is not going to tighten. The Fed is ultimately going to be easing as inflation is accelerating. And that's going to be the kiss of death for the dollar. People are going to realize the box that the Federal Reserve has put itself in. Because as inflation picks up because of the weak dollar and as bond prices fall, and of course, rising interest rates feed into inflation, right? As interest rates go up, how many companies have debt? That's part of their costs. Your, your debt is going up and now you raise your prices, right? So it's all part of it. High interest rates are prices too. So interest rates rising are all part of the inflationary cycle. So interest rates are rising, food prices, everything is going up. And now the economy is tanking. And now, of course, the layoffs start. Right? All of a sudden, a lot of these jobs, a lot of these part-time jobs, unemployment is going to start to pick up at the same time that inflation is accelerating. Right? We're going into stagflation. And when you have a stagflation, the Fed, based on its Keynesian playbook, they have to choose which monster do they want to fight. Do they want to try to fight the recession or do they want to try to fight inflation? Because they can't do both because it's the opposite policy tool. Right? Because you're supposed to tighten to fight inflation. You're supposed to ease to fight recession and rising unemployment. So you can't tighten and ease at the same time. So they have to choose. They have to pick their poison. What are they going to pick? See, either way, I think I win. Either way, I think you know, I'm going to make a ton of money in the market. But I think what, what's going to drive gold the highest and the dollar the lowest is if they make the politically expedient choice and they decide to try to prop up the economy and prop up the markets and prop up Trump's presidency, try to get him reelected. I think he's going to fail. I don't think Trump is going to get reelected. I think we're going to be in a massive recession in 2020, and it's all going to be blamed on Trump and the Republicans because he promised so much and he's going to deliver so little. So many people went in the voting booth excited that he was going to make America great again. 
that he was going to drain the swamp. Right? The swamp is a lot deeper now since he's been elected, and he's going to be even deeper in it by the time the election comes along. And what, I'm, what I think is going to happen, and everybody's been all excited, and I said this you know, last time I was here, that Trump's going to be a one-termer, that he's not another uh, G, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, he's another Jimmy Carter. He's a one-termer sandwiched between two uh, 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 um, the opposite party because he inherited a disaster and now you know, claimed ownership of it. And now he's going to be the fall guy. He's going to be blamed. And when we get this currency crisis, this dollar crisis, massive inflation, it's going to be worse than the 2008 financial crisis for the average guy. right? And that crisis gave us Obama. The next one is going to give us somebody some much worse. It's going to be a Bernie Sanders-style socialist. That's who's going to be president of the United States in, in 2021. It's going to be a socialist. And he's going to have a socialist Congress, most likely. He's going to have Democrats in the House. and Because and, everything's going to be blamed on the Republicans. It's all the fault of tax cuts on the rich, tax cuts on corporations. Right? Trump inherited a great economy, and he blew it. He went back to the failed policies of Bush that caused the 2008 financial crisis, and now he made it worse. That's what they're going to say, and the socialists are going to ride that wave of discontent into the White House, and everybody talks about all these tax cuts, are they temporary, or are they permanent? They're all temporary. There's no such thing as a permanent tax cuts because all taxes can be raised. And in 2021, they will be raised, right? But also, we're gonna raise big government because capitalism is gonna get the blame, just like capitalism got the blame for 2008. Capitalism had nothing to do with that. The Federal Reserve created that crisis, the government created that crisis, and the crisis that's coming is also the fault of an even bigger government that gained even more power. The Federal Reserve gained even more power as a result of 2008. And so they're, they're going to usurp even more. And I, I have no idea what the country is going to become in, uh, in, um, in 2021. But hopefully, hopefully, I'll end on an optimistic note, uh, we can have the swing the other way in 2024. Because it's, it's, it, it'll be a complete disaster by then. And I think it's somewhere in that time zone, in that time horizon, that you'll see the price of gold and the Dow at the same price. Thanks.